Hi everyone and welcome to uh, today's webinar. Um, today um, I'm not alone. With me I have uh, my friend Dako Vukovic, who is the founder and CEO of uh, Poly API, and he will tell us about uh, Poly API and what you what you can do with it and which cool use cases you can depict using the Poly API platform. So it's basically a very young um, product, very young platform, which uh, was just created um, uh, and which is now um, going to, to, to the beta phase um, with first uh, real world use cases. So uh, it is a good idea maybe to also look into into such uh, such an interesting platform and to to um, check your use cases about it. I will tell you a little bit more. Daco, can you um, go further one slide, please? So just some housekeeping rules um, during the webinar. All participants are muted. Um, if you have any questions, so please use the questions panel from GoToMeeting. So we will... Um, pick them up and answer them uh, as they arise um, and also after we are finished with the webinar you are, will still have the, the chance to, to place any any kind of questions in the questions panel. Um, this webinar will be recorded and um, after afterwards uh, tomorrow or the day after you will receive an email where you can where you have access to the slides and also to uh, to the recording of the webinar. Um, yeah, and I already talked about the rest of the slides. So um, let me just uh, give you a short short introduction. So what we what we what we see in in today's world is when we talk about modern architectures, also about modernization stories, is that APIs are um, very essential for any kind of modernization um, strategy uh, that um, enterprises are trying to to evolve. Um, and um, we have very good concepts um, and very good technologies on that side to to depict um, the the API creation, API deployment, and also API monitoring. So they have a consistent view. What kind of APIs do I have inside my enterprise? Also um, to learn about how my APIs are used by my consumers and if they are used so that I can depict a, a, a full lifecycle API management we can also we are also able today to to automate everything um, in conjunction with the API lifecycle. So from API design with an API first design approach over to deploy, monitor, and further enhance our APIs, and to also provide the information what kind of APIs do I have in in my enterprise and API platforms today also typically are uh, able to depict the complex scenarios, complex architectures we have. So um, also depicting hybrid multi-cloud um, API landscapes on platforms. So that's quite essential. What is a bit of um, a bit of forgotten is the consumer perspective of of the APIs. I already mentioned. We have the visibility was when when introducing an API strategy, we will gain visibility. What kind of APIs do I have? Uh, and most of the time, um, what we do, we um, we create kind of a central API portal, developer portal, something like that, where you can look up the APIs that are around that have been deployed and published inside your enterprise. Um, you can you can uh, take this for internal purposes, also for external purposes, for your business partners, for your for your customers. Um, but 
those API portals and developer portals have the focus on providing um, a view on the open API specification maybe just was what was created while doing the API design and an open API document even if it is surrendered by the by the portals is quite technical so um, people are not able also especially line of business people um, are not able to really make sense of those API documentations. Technical people, maybe if they are familiar with Open API, can use them without um, without problems. If the API contract is well designed and all that kind of stuff. <clears throat> but what we also see is that <clears throat> we already have existing APIs inside um, enterprises that are maybe not documented yet. Um, because uh, they are relics from the past where uh, this holistic API management approach with having a consistent API description was not established yet. And there are questions, how can we um, also make those APIs that are not documented with an open API specification, how can we make them discoverable? And discoverability is, and, and, um, and, um, um, good uh, discoverability is the thing where um, poly api comes into into the game because it provides a completely different approach of discovering the apis in my enterprise by um, providing uh, the possibility to really um, ask the um, the platform what kind of APIs or uh, what kind of APIs do I have? I need an API to uh, to get all my employee data, and then you will be provided with the respective information. And this is what um, Daco is going to show us and telling us a little bit more about what Poly API is aiming at. Daco. Thank you, Sven. Uh, can you hear me okay? Okay, awesome. Uh, so thank you very much, Sven. Uh, like Sven mentioned, uh, I've been in this space for uh, about 12 years now. Prior to starting Poly API, I used to work at Google Apogee, and before that, I was at Oracle. And uh, I started off in APIs at MuleSoft back in 2012, I believe it was. So uh, it's it's been a, a really great journey, and. Uh, one thing like Sven noticed that that's been a, a big gap in the market is a focus on helping companies consume and manage the consumption of APIs. So there's a lot of focus on exposing and securing and producing APIs. And I want to introduce you to Poly, which is really aimed at the second half of that equation. So I did a survey of about 160 people uh, in the domain, and it was a it was a one-on-one -on -one interviews, uh, so not quite a, a survey, but more so a, a little miniature research project. And there were about eight top uh, API and event consumption uh, problems, but the three that surfaced to the top as being the most difficult uh, and the most painful and costly uh, and common were that one, the discovery of APIs and events takes time. And it takes a lot of time to both identify what's available to you, like Sven mentioned, but also to validate, to make sure that, hey, this does produce the data I'm looking for. It does actually, you know, support the, the scale and performance I'm looking for. And um, so, so really, it's just to make sure that there are the APIs and that they do what they do. And if this is not done well, developers lose a lot of time kind of finding them, but also they potentially introduce new services that do the same thing as existing services and so now you have you know duplication of capabilities whether in-house or external um, and so enterprises really want to address this problem the second big one is that just gaining access to the apis is also quite difficult and the reason behind it is because not that OAuth 2 as a specification is difficult to understand for a developer, but more so the decisions in the authorization model. So what user having which scopes and which role can get a token 
for which endpoint and what scopes are necessary in that token to be able to access that endpoint. And then adhering to the security standards around you know, the refresh intervals and making sure that you're you know, managing the refresh token correctly. So we see an opportunity here to really level up company security by making uh, end user based authorization for API access a lot easier. So this is another big problem that, that we're hoping uh, to address here. And then the last one is uh, really just the exercise of learning how an API works. So what we heard back from the market is that generally you have to read some document, maybe it's an open API specification, maybe it's a PDF, maybe it's a, a portal with documentation um, in, in you know, text. Um, and then you generally have to move into like a trial and error. And sometimes the portal gives you a console where you can kind of try it, but most people prefer to use tools like Postman or Insomnia to really just try the API, make it get at work. And oftentimes, if you can't get it work and you get stuck, you generally just have to know the right person. Maybe that's a developer inside your company who's used this API. Maybe it's the producer of the API you have to get a hold of. Maybe you have to file a ticket for support and then wait for that to be addressed. So again, nothing here is you know extremely so difficult, but there's just these pockets of time being wasted in this end-to-end -end experience, um, you know, and, and developers are quite expensive, so we don't want to waste their time, and we want to make sure that we can make them as productive as possible. And the, and the cool thing here is um, that you are not just focusing on on uh, on uh, REST APIs, right? But you're also focusing on asynchronous APIs um, when you exchange data. In a message broker like Kafka or something like that. Yeah, it's a, it's a great uh, question, Sven. So there's a there's a point in time answer to that question. So today at the beta, we support REST APIs, we support webhooks, um, uh, and then in the near future, before GA, we'll add support for GraphQL and GraphQL subscriptions. And then over time, we you know based on market demand and our customer demand, we look to add additional. Uh, protocols like you mentioned, Kafka, uh, but also potentially working backwards in time and adding support for SOAP and, and things like that as well. Cool. So we noticed there's kind of you know four and a half or five primary use cases uh, where API consumption is really important. So the first one looks something like this. You have internal APIs that are being consumed by developers and those developers are external to your company. And they tend to be classified as amateurs in your domain, right? So it doesn't necessarily mean they're bad developers. They could be excellent developers, but they don't understand your domain. Maybe your domain is payments. Maybe your domain is logistics. Maybe your domain is uh, supply chain management. So it's it's kind of a, a new topic to them. And so they don't understand you know, the data structures, the data models, the endpoints, the resource naming convention in your industry. And so really, what Poly can do is help you make it much easier for those developers to consume. And I'll show today's demo uh, how to do that. But also, it would lower your support costs. We've heard from a number of our beta customers that you know support costs is really high for their API. Uh, and then they also have frustrated partners or frustrated you know, public developers. And so they want to address that. Now, a different consumption use case, but you know, very similar, is that the audience is now actually internal developers. And those internal developers are maybe building applications. And so here, it's really strictly a discovery problem of, hey, what APIs are available to me? How do I gain access to those APIs? Um, and how could I be more productive with them? But there is a, a second flavor of this where they're actually consuming external APIs and this is more of a governance and security problem where you as a, an IT department, you want to make sure that your external API, that A, you're aware of which ones are being used, B, you can control the degree of access, C, you can enforce good practices for managing you know, credentials and secrets and keys and things of that sort. But at the same time, you want to provide a great developer experience for your internal developers. And so we see a big opportunity for Poly to help uh, here as well. A slight modification of that one is integrations where for some reason, you know, based on your industry, 
your customers demand that your product or your services be integrated out of the box with different systems. And those integrations, we have customers that have 90 such integrations. And, and basically what happens is they become so hard to manage because you're dealing with 90 different APIs, each with potentially a dozen or more operations. And each one is being versioned and maintained and updated and has uptimes and downtimes and incidents. And so how do you get a handle of that? So it's still very much a, a kind of a governance problem, but it's really for the purpose of you know, enabling deals and allowing your company to, to grow your business through uh, supporting more out-of-the-box integrations. And then a new uh, pat pattern that's shown up here is that there's a whole new class of consumers of APIs, uh, and which are referred to as AI agents. Um, and so you can think of you know, ChatGPT with its plugin model as being a great example of an AI agent. And what it does is it has to know what APIs are available to it, and it has to make the API call at real time. And what that means is that it makes the determination of which API to use based on the user's intentions, and it then has to structure the API call and execute the API call. And then it gets a response back and it has to interpret and use that data to serve the user. And so there's, I, you know, this is a prediction on my part, but in the research I've done so far and the APIs I've tested, I would say 99% of APIs are gonna have to change or evolve to be able to support AI agents out of the box. Um, a simple example is, you know, Shopify is an e-commerce system and its product API returns back an inventory. Well, maybe you want the inventory to be available to developers because you assume that the person who's presenting your product catalog isn't gonna display that to the customers. But the AI agent, for example, if, if the current inventory is zero, the AI agent will say, oh, you know what? Be careful, don't order this product because uh, it's out of stock, right? So it actually kind of potentially could hurt your business if these a APIs are not consumable because the AI agent actually serves the interest of the end consumer. So you have to be really careful of like how you're exposing your data and functionality to it. So these are, these are kind of the primary use cases and they might look like totally different products uh, if I showed you a demo, but at the end of the day, they're all strictly API consumption use cases with just different flavors to them. And so in today's demo, I'm gonna show you end-to-end -end, um, uh, and I'm going to be using our new product uh, beta build which is going to be available later this week where um, you know we're going to make it open generally um, and so basically the end-to-end -end flow of how poly works and this is where a lot of these kind of new innovations come in is that number one we learn APIs by watching users use them and today at the beta we're supporting just Postman. And so the idea is that if you can show us how this API works in Postman, Polly will capture information of your usage and it will actually learn how to use that API. And it will classify it, name it, give it a description and build a model around it so it understands how that API works. And then what we do with that data, we do a couple of things. The first thing we do is we power an AI assistant, which is embedded as an extension to VS Code. VS Code for now, more IDEs to come. And this AI assistant uses our discovery service with the data that Polly has in its data set of APIs, the catalog, and it uses OpenAI behind the scenes to generate a unique response to every user based on their prompt. And I'll be showing you guys this today, but this, this fundamentally changes the nature of the API discovery space because it goes from being a, a kind of a browse experience where you have, like Sven mentioned, a rendered open API specification and you see, you know, dozens if not hundreds of operations and you're kind of going through a menu and finding the one you care about. And this basically changes it to you saying, here's what I'm trying to do. What's the right function? And give me an example and give it to me in this particular programming language. And so this thing will basically generate that response and give you uh, ability to use that API as part of your uh, application. The other thing we do is we generate uh, a library 
And today we just support TypeScript, but Python will be next and more languages will be supported. And this library is basically built on either the full catalog or a subset of the catalog of those functions that Polly knows. And so then the idea is that you now get functions that you can invoke that, that basically are proxies for those backend APIs and events. And then those functions, this is, you know, through the proxies where you get a lot of that nice, you know, those nice features in the future, we don't have it today, but being able to see which client uses which API, which operation, how much, and we want to take this to the next level. We actually want to be able to tie together the story to tell you which clients use which elements of the payloads of those APIs. So that when an API is changed or there's a proposed change, Polly would be able to generate an impact analysis to tell you exactly which client applications would be impacted and how they would be impacted, and maybe even propose suggested modifications to those clients on how to alleviate the impact. And so there's gonna be a lot of power from basically uh, Polly being able to observe the runtime traffic as well, and provide monitoring on top of it there. But today I'll show you the client library and using it and how it's beneficial to a, a developer. The other thing we have is the ability to then wrap those, uh, you know, uh, to basically wrap those functions, but also write your own custom functions and deploy those to the Poly server as custom server side functions. Uh, and so there basically the idea is that that API, uh, the, the generated function, is maybe a subset of what you want to accomplish. Maybe there's an orchestration of multiple APIs you want to accomplish, and you want to wrap that as a function to make it further more consumable. And so the name Polly really comes from two things. One is this ability to teach uh, the API to Polly, but to teach multiple variations of it. And I'll show you guys to that today. So that the same API could manifest itself as multiple specialized functions, but then the ability to then further write additional functions, kind of like Amazon Lambda on top of those to even further specialize them and make them more powerful. But the beauty is that any custom function you write goes back into that catalog and becomes discoverable through the rest of the organization, but also becomes part of that client library. So it's immediately consumable. And then the last piece, uh, which we'll, we'll try to demo today, I have to admit, um, it's a new environment uh, that we built this in, so there might be some bugs along the way, but we'll try to get through the whole experience where I'll actually show you how to generate a plugin for OpenAI, and then we'll use OpenAI's ChatGPT to use that plugin through the Poly platform to access backend APIs. So this is kind of the, the vision of Poly, um, you know, as it is today for our version one. And then there'll be more capabilities that, that kind of come in the future. Sven, any uh, questions or comments before we transition into a demo? So far, I can see um, no questions or comments from the attendees. Maybe, okay. maybe that those will come when we or when you show the real world example or the the the, the demo. And uh, also something I wanted to mention here because I I was lucky to get my hands on the on the alpha version and this was already very interesting to see what is possible and the things that you show here on that slide um, are even more enhanced and uh, even more um, complete from a vision perspective. It's absolutely awesome. Great. Yeah. No. Thank you, Sven. So we'll start first in the demo, we'll start with the AI assistant and just strictly from the perspective of a consumer. And then I will show you behind the scenes of the trainer, um, how you add additional functions to Poly. So we're gonna start in VS Code and we'll start with the AI assistant here. Let me just double check. Uh, you can see VS Code okay, Sven? Sure, yeah. Great, so just to orient you guys, we have you know four things presented here. Uh, the first one is here, it's Polly, the AI assistant, and this is basically our extension. And this allows you to ask natural language questions and get responses back. So 
Um, you know, since I know it's a German audience today, I'm going to actually use, you know, Google Translate here and I could say, you know, how do I get a list of products from Shopify? And we'll do something like this and we could see the German equivalent and then uh, we'll go ahead and ask Polly that. And basically what this AI assistant is doing is it's first going through our catalog, but keep in mind our catalog is all in English. So it has to first figure out how to query our catalog using a German prompt, and then it basically selects, selects the set of functions that are relevant to this prompt. And then it basically uses um, OpenAI to generate the response that addresses this user's question, and hopefully we'll get the right function, and hopefully we'll get it in, in German here in just a moment. Now, the other three things that we're presenting here is just a terminal we'll use to you know, run, execute our scripts, an editor to write some TypeScript applications. And then we also have the poly tree here. And the poly tree is basically just a rendering of what shows up when you build the poly client library. So here I built it and in this environment, it's quite new. So I only have you know, about a dozen operations, but you can then further scope it where you can say something like, context equals Shopify. And then basically what that will do is it'll custom build a uh, library for you that has just the context that you're interested in. I could even say something like context shopify.products and that will build it, you know, just for the products context within Shopify. And so you could see that that's all that's presented to me here. So the idea is that uh, you can have a very big catalog, but the library, the dependencies, uh, is gonna be pretty slim. Okay, so I, I'm, I'm afraid, I think the German threw it off a little bit um, here. So I will try a slightly different uh, uh, set of products. So I think it likes to, yeah, product list, I, I noticed I was testing it a little bit the other days, but I figured I would give it a shot. But Basically, some translations between English and German are, uh, you know, a little bit different, so it creates new words, so it throws it off, so we'll, we'll have to work on that to GA, but I guess, Sven, is it fair to say that this is how you would have prompted it in, in German? Um, sure. We also, we also say um, a list of products, so, so what, what, did you, what did you put in before? Yeah, I, uh, I had a... Oh, okay, yeah, that's... Yeah, yeah, that's... Uh... Yeah, so it's interesting, like, yeah, for some reason, product list, the word throws it off. And even though I've checked behind the scenes, Polly does find the right function. But when we ask the AI to use that function, <clears throat> it, for some reason, doesn't like the way it's formatted. But anyways, just a slightly different formatting of the question, and we could see that it found this function, and then it found a second function, uh, or sorry, the, it gives you an example of how to use that function. So in this case, it said, you know, you can use this uh, list of functions, or sorry, this uh, function, which gets you a limited list of products. But then I might say something like, you know, I don't want a set of products. How do I get all products from Shopify? Uh, and we'll basically prompt it this one as well. And we'll see that, you know, Behind the scenes, I've trained Polly on two flavors of the same operation. One that takes in a limited number, and then one that basically gives you all of them. Uh, and so we'll see that here. But in the meantime, I'll go ahead and start uh, programming here. So I'll just go ahead and do something like import uh, Polly from Polly API. So that imports our client library that's generated by the statement. Uh, and you can see here's the other function, which is basically all of them. Uh, so I'll actually just go ahead and use this one here to start me. And then I'll say something like async function. Uh, let's say uh, list products. And then I'll go ahead and wrap that. And I'll put something like this in there. And I'll say, you know, const response equals the product list. And then we'll make this asynchronous uh, because it, it needs to, you know, go off and do it. 
Um, so basically here, I didn't have to go learn the Shopify API, but somebody had to teach it to Polly. And we'll get to the training experience in just a moment. So this is just strictly as a consumer. I didn't have to go to a portal. I didn't have to look through a whole list of things. I could just ask my natural language question in whatever language I feel most comfortable communicating in, and it'll find the right function for me. And then let's go ahead and just log the products here. So we'll do product response, and then we'll invoke this function, and we'll just do something like this. So just kind of a hello world, just warming up uh, to get Polly going. Uh, and we'll just run this guy. And we should see a log of, you know, a response basically from Shopify. We got a 200, but you can see it has all these headers and then my data is buried in there, right? So now let's just uh, maybe go a little bit deeper and let's just print the, the actual data that comes back. So you'll see that IntelliSense kicks in here and I can actually see what the object model is gonna look like. So I got my products, I can pick the first product, I can look inside it and I see the elements that I'm gonna get back before I even ever you know, exercise this function. So for now, I'll just go ahead and list all the products in here and then we'll go ahead and run it one more time. And we can see that, you know, here's a bunch of products coming back from Shopify. But, you know, this is quite a lot of products. And so maybe I wanna be able to control how many products I get. And, you know, obviously the way you train Polly, you can train it to have offsets and all kinds of great stuff. But maybe I wanna to switch to using this other function that gives me a specific number of, of uh, products. So I'm just gonna go ahead and substitute this. Uh, and another way I'll show it to you is that we actually have IntelliSense kick in on the context too. So you have the ability to just explore Polly by basically seeing what's in here. Now, if I generated a, a wider, uh, instead of just generating for, for Shopify, I generate the full library here in this case, we'll see that here, now when I go Polly dot, I can see I have different services I can pull from. So there's just kind of a different way to do it. But the last view I also wanna show you is this tree. And the tree is meant to be a representation of what's built inside this client library. And I can also cherry pick the functions from here. And so I can hover over it and I could see, you know, a description of the function. And then I can also see, you know, the, the count, et cetera. And all of this was generated by the AI at the time of training, which I'll show you in just a minute here. But anyways, let's go ahead and complete this demo. So I'll just go Shopify dot, products dot let's say get a limited list of you know just two we'll hit save we'll run it one more time and we should see just two products show up this time so we've got one which is this uh tv and one which is this refrigerator now i can build a whole application around this but i can also build an integration with this so how poly is different than say mulesoft or Ricardo or these other systems is that I'm programming, I'm just using Node.js here. Maybe I like to use Python. Maybe I like to write in Go, right? So the idea is, can I bring you the connectivity, like the connectors, but still let you express yourself fully in the code that you prefer to write? Um, and so that's, that's really the, the beauty of Poly. Now, a, a slightly different function is maybe we wanna get the details of one product. So I'm gonna go ahead and switch this function here to be instead of list limited, I'm going to get the you know, details by ID and I'll paste this in here. But let's take it a little bit further now. Instead of just logging it, let's go ahead and maybe use a completely different service. In this case, let's use OpenAI to generate a, just kind of a one line promotional tag that we can send to a user. So I might say something like, how would I use OpenAI? generate, uh, uh, let's say, uh, uh, a description for a product. And let's say a promotional description for a product. So let's just copy this one. We'll ask it to Polly here. Um, and while we wait for it, um, I'll basically just jump a little bit ahead in the interest of time. Oh, unless there's any uh, questions right now, Sven, do you see any from the audience? Nope. So okay. far, we don't have any questions. <clears throat> cool. Oh, yes. So in this case, I know I have this function here, 
uh, which is basically generates a response using GPT-4. Uh, and basically, I can start using it while we wait for the AI to give us a response, uh, just in the interest of time. So now this function, I could say something like, you know, const AI response is going to equal to using poly to access open AI to do a chat completion. And it expects an instruction, which is a string and some context. And again, when I trained it, I, I implicitly made this choice to make it easy to use for my consumers. So in this case here, let's say that the instruction is to generate a one line promo uh, tagline. And then the con, and let's say for this product, and the context I'm going to pass into this API is going to actually be the description of this product from Shopify. So let's go ahead and do something like a product response. And I want to get uh, the data. And I want to get the product. Uh, and inside it, we should have a body.html. So again, Polly knows this object model that it was built just from training. So we'll take the body of the product from Shopify and we'll pass it to OpenAI and we'll ask it to generate a one-line promo tagline for this product. Uh, and it looks like on the side here, we did get a response. Again, I think something with the German is just throwing it off a little bit. So let me see if I can, uh, I'll just ask it in English and I do apologize for the audience. We're still working out the details. So do I use OpenAI to generate a response, let's say. Uh, so we'll, we'll keep going here with the demo. Uh, and so now that we have this response, let's see what it actually creates for us. So I'll do a console.log and I'll you know, do the AI response. And in here, I'll take the response from it and we'll do the first choice. Uh, well, and, and again, it's like you do have to a little bit understand or kind of explore the model. And now the idea is that the AI system will be able to give you that path at the beta, the AI agent just knows the functions. It doesn't know the, the response objects just yet, but that's something we want to add for, for GA. So we'll just take the, the first response here and we'll take its content and we'll go ahead and log it. So let's go ahead and fire this up. And so now we're going to Shopify, getting the details for this product, going to open AI and asking it to generate a one-line promo. And so we could see, you know, chill in style, the sleek, efficient fridge for your today's modern home. Wonderful. Now let's go take it one step further and let's actually send an SMS to a user with this uh, product description. So I'll say something like, you know, in here we have Twilio. Uh, I could do Twilio send, which is a function we can use here. And I'll go ahead and say const, or actually we don't even need to log anything, we can just fire away and, and trust that it's going to work. So here I can just synchronously send it. And the two phone number, I'm going to go ahead and use my Google voice number here. So I'm just going to go ahead and copy this number here. And we'll go ahead and put it in here. And get rid of some of these little characters. And then the message, we're just going to go ahead and generate a message here by basically taking the AI's response and a link to the product. So I'll do something like this, where I'll use a path param to say, hey, let's grab uh, the, the actual response here. And we can see that Polly here, uh, you know, gives you an, an understanding of, of how you can use this thing. So it, it gave us that right function. Um, so I just, I don't know, I have, to, I have to work on the German. I apologize to the audience. I, our goal is to be fully international and speak all the languages at, at V1. So in here, I'll use a template param to grab the tagline. And then I'll use basically the, the base of the URL for my Shopify store, which is, you know, Darko demo store, my Shopify.com. So we'll put that in here and then we'll do products. And then we'll inject another template param slash and we'll use the response from Shopify. Let me make just a little bit of room here because there's a long string here so that the audience can see it fully. 
And in here, we'll introspect this again. We'll do dot data, uh, dot product. And then there is this uh, handle element, which is basically the URL. And then we'll go ahead and send that via SMS. And I'll go ahead and get rid of this console log statement and we'll run it one more time. And this time we should just see it close and then we should be able to switch to the Google Voice and we should hopefully see a message come here in just a second. And you can see that it sent me the chill and style and then it generated this URL. Now this is this URL is good, but my store is not public. So or actually no, it is. So I guess I'm because I'm logged in as an admin, you can see it here. Um, so yeah, so just kind of showing how like that's now three different services that I've implemented, uh, you know, just right before your eyes using Poly as the integration kind of tool in this case, using TypeScript as my preferred language of program. Now, let's say that somebody, you know, fudges it and gives you the wrong, uh, I, you know, number here. So the wrong product number, and this thing, you know, tries to do it, and you know, it just it basically crashes because you know OpenAI doesn't like it, and so really like we're trying to read this body thing but it doesn't work because the no product was returned and so we have a 404 on our hands that we're not catching right so now i could say something like this right where if my product's response dot status equals 200 then go ahead and do this code right here but if it's not then we we have to handle that as an error so I'll just drop this in here, you know, else let's just say something like this for this demo. We'll do a console log statement and we'll say something like, uh, you know, Shopify, oops, I need to do this, Shopify API failed with a template param products response dot status. And let's try this again now. So now we can see that we caught the 404 and we handled it and logged it and we can see that we failed with the 404 whereas if we do provide the right product id then you know we should see it work and maybe we'll get another text message talking about the, the same refrigerator for us so really just kind of showcasing like you have the full power of code here you can do whatever math and computations use whatever other libraries you want you can just really mash it up and these APIs, you know, become just part of your code, right? Like, and you don't have to sit, go through and learn them and deal with them to use them, right? Um, and so this, I think, opens it up, even though it's still development, I think it opens it up to a lot of different audiences that are kind of tech savvy, but are not necessarily kind of professional developers as well. But even as a developer, I, I find this really nice that I have the full object model defined for me, I get you know the wrapper, the status code. I just get this nice way to access these APIs. Uh, even if I want to rewrite it later for some reason, maybe scale, performance, I don't trust Poly, whatever. This is still just a great kind of demo concept POC tool uh, that I can use. Uh, Sven, any questions so far? Otherwise, I'd love to show how to do a, a custom function with this. You don't have any questions, Taco. Great. So let's wrap this as a, a custom function now, because let's say that this capability, I, I find this really useful, right? Like I want to use this uh, in different cases, but I want to allow everybody inside my company to use it too. So the first thing I want to do is I want to maybe, you know, extract this product ID. We don't want it to be hard coded, right? So we expect people to pass it in as an argument. Um, so let's say, and also our function name is not a great name. So let's say, it really should be get details of product uh, and send SMS, right? Kind of a, a long uh, name for it, but really, you know, that's more accurate. Uh, uh, or let's even just say get, you know, get product and send SMS. Now I'm going to go ahead and declare that this function should get a product ID, which I want to be a number. And then it's also going to have a, uh, uh, sorry, a user phone number that we want to send it to. And that's going to be a string. 
So here I'm declaring kind of the new interface, almost creating a new derivative API on top of it, basically. Very similar to what you do with AWS Lamp. And so here I want my product ID to be passed in. And then I want the user phone number to be used instead of this hard-coded value. And then in here, or actually, let me just catch those before I lose them. So I'll put one right here. And then I'll put this one right here. And then I'll make this one a string. And now we'll change these to product ID and this one to user phone number. Okay, great. And then the other big thing I want to do is I want to uh, return a, a successful message because I don't want my users to just hope that it worked. So I want to be able to say, you know, in here we'll say uh, const Twilio response is going to be equal to this. And then, you know, let's go ahead and return. And again, you want to, if if it's successful or whatnot, you can you can build whatever logic you want, but I'll just do it quickly here. So I'll just do it to your response dot data dot uh, status. Cool. So we'll just return the Twilio status to the end user. And then in this case here, we, we don't want to log this because that would just get logged who knows where. We want to actually go ahead and just return this string. Uh, now, our function needs to declare that it's going to return something. So I'll, I'll put here that it's going to give a promise of a string. Cool. So now we can test this function locally. You know, before we you know, push it out into the ether, uh, we can test it locally and to make sure it works. So now I'll run this guy one more time. And, you know, well, I need to return. I need to do something with it, so I apologize. So const response, or actually, you know what? Sorry, we could see that the message worked. So in the interest of time, I'm just going to go ahead and do this. So let's go to our phone number here, and let's see that we got yep, yet another one just on time, so that's great. So now, and by the way, you'll notice that every time the AI generated a string, it was different, right? So that's kind of the beauty of that. AI, using AI in your applications is you have that variety, you have that, uh, you know, and this is governed by the temperature setting on the API. Uh, but yeah, so let's go back here. And now that we have this thing, let's make this a custom function so that people can just use it right out of the gate. And I do have to apologize. I did find a bug in my custom functions uh, where, you know, some, for some reason it didn't like deploying it to the server. So as a substitute for this demo, I'm just going to deploy it locally. But you know, know that you can deploy these to the Poly server. Um, it's just a little bit of a fluke in this in this environment. So here to deploy it, to publish it to the catalog, you basically say, hey, I want to add this function. So you give it the name. And then I want to put it inside a context. So let's think about what context would this be good in in our library here. So maybe I'll say, I want to put this inside, uh, you know, let's say notifications, oops, inside the context of, let's say notifications. And then let's make sure we spell that right. And then, you know, you specify the file that it's going to come from. So in this case, it's test.ts and for the description, We'll give it a little bit of a description. Let me just move this little guy out of the way. We'll do something like a new custom function, which takes in a product ID and a phone number and sends a URL with a AI generated string to a user uh, via their SMS phone. Okay, we'll deploy something like this. Uh, we'll go ahead and hit submit. And so now this is adding a custom function to Poly. It added a new custom function. And we can see that within uh, notifications, we have this get product and send. We see our description there such that now I really don't need any of this. I can comment all of this out 
And now I can just use this new custom function, which we can also discover through the assistant. So I could say something like, is there a custom function I can use to uh, send a link to a user uh, about a product? And it should find it. Uh, again, this thing has a little bit of a world of its own. So, uh, you know, I'm doing this real time. We'll see if it works, but we'll let that guy search for it. But in the meantime, I'm just going to go ahead and use this function here and hit save. And then we shouldn't, we don't even need the await statement. We can just fire it off. And in this case, I'll copy this product ID and this phone number and hit save. And uh, we can go ahead and just fix this to a string. And we can run this guy in the meantime. And yeah, it looks like this guy also found our, our function here. and gives you a little comment to replace it with the actual product ID and the actual phone number. So that's quite nice. Uh, and then, yeah, we should be able to go here. And, and then we see, you know, another one just came in. So uh, with a new description. Um, Sven, how are we doing on time? I'd love to showcase the training next if, if we have time. So we have uh, nine minutes left. Okay, so I'll be extremely fast. Um, basically, the way training works is in Postman, we give you a, a set of scripts that you can put at the parent collection that you want to train within. And what these scripts do is they capture the request, the response, and the Postman configuration. So in this case here, I have a, an API ready for creating a new task in Asana. And I'm going to go ahead and just pick my Asana environment here for these variables to come in. And then I'm going to also show you just really quickly Asana to show you that there's nothing on this board right now. So again, Asana is just meant to be a representative API. It could be anything internal, external, doesn't matter. So we hit send. We see that it succeeded. We see we got a tool on create. And down here in the console log, we should see that Polly also learned it. It takes a few seconds because the AI is basically analyzing it and then it's generating it. And we see that we got a a response from Polly that's a 201. So that means it learned it successfully. Now we'll see that in Asana, this order was created and that came from Postman. But now if I go back to VS Code, I regenerate my library. And basically we'll see that now there's this new function under Asana, tasks, create, which shows up. And such that we can actually go ahead and use it. I'll comment this out. And we'll drop this in here and we'll just fire it off asynchronously again uh, just to you know in the interest of time and i'm going to go ahead and borrow a few variables from asana just to to kind of make this a little bit faster so here's my project id we'll drop that in i know my section id is one number higher and the task name we'll just say hi all and then demo with Sven. okay i'll hit save well, run it again. In the meantime, I'll ask here, how do I create a new task in Asana? We'll let that fire off and think about it. And we should be able to go to Asana and see that we get a new task. Why did it not? Uh, did I? Oh, I, I generated my library. I'm sorry. I didn't actually run the script. Okay, so we could see hi all, uh, demo with Sven, uh, and just a, a, again, a quick, simple, very simple showcase of like how the training works. But the beauty of this is that you really get, you know, uh, response equals, and then here, you know, you can do all kinds of nice stuff. So response dot, uh, oh, I have to do a wait. Okay, and we should have the, you have the full object model. So it learns exactly what it's gonna get back from Asana. And this is you know, corresponding one-to-one -to, -one to what the actual API gave us through Postman. And we can see in real time here, it knows how to generate a response on how to use that function to actually invoke it. So I didn't get to generating a, a ChatGPT plugin today. I, that's gonna just be a little bit more involved. Maybe Sven, we could do that at a different time or you know, I can encourage the audience to go check out our Vimeo page, which has a bunch of videos showcasing how to do this. 
but yeah, I wanted to, you know, just show you guys, Polly, if you're really, if, if anything here piqued your interest, if you'd like to participate in our beta, try it out in your own environment at your own company, or just talk to us to see if there's an opportunity to help you out with any of the API consumption problems you might have, please don't hesitate to reach out. Sven and I would uh, love to work with you. So thank you, Sven. Um, uh, back over to you. Sven, you're on mute. I'm I, sorry if you're speaking. We can't hear you. Uh, sorry, yeah. Um, yeah, um, thank you, Darko. Um, it's uh, completely um, awesome what you what you guys are doing here with with the Poly platform, and I think it's it's a disruptive thing um, how API consumption will uh, happen in the in the future or how it can happen in the future. So. Um, very um, interesting and thanks for having you. Um, basically, when you are talking about uh, beta and trying it out in the own companies, um, what does it mean? Where? What is the, the, the required runtime for, for Poly? Does it run as a shared cloud service? Is it something you deploy on-prem in your environment? What is it? What is it? Yeah, it's a it's a great question. So we have two choices for the beta, and we'll we'll have these same two choices for GA. Uh, we we can either host it for you in our Kubernetes environment, and you basically get your own private tenant where all your data is private, or if you want to, you can also run our service in Kubernetes yourself. And so we have customers doing both, and we we really encourage both because we want to try both sides of the equation. Uh, but for the beta, if you don't want to get your DevOps team involved, I totally understand. If you would just want to try it in our environment to get, get familiar with it, that's totally fine. And then later, if you want to switch to having it in your own environment, that's totally okay too. So uh, both are options on the table for, for the audience then. Cool. Thank you. So basically, um, I think um, we can uh, we can uh, can be curious to see what what will happen in the future. Maybe we can do another session uh, once the beta is done to, to see also what uh, when you guys have uh, included all the feedback that comes from the beta and before the the final product is 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 released. Um, as I see in the questions panel, we don't have any questions. But as Darko mentioned, if you have any kind of questions um, the next days when you when this everything Daco was was telling you have settled and you have made up your mind about it maybe also discovered potential use cases don't hesi hesitate to to reach out to us um, you will also receive the recording as I mentioned uh, at the very first beginning and yeah with that from my from my side thanks for attending thanks for your interest and uh, have a nice day. And thanks, Daco, for having you. Thank you, Sven. I really appreciate your time and, and hosting me here. And thank you for the audience for attending. Bye, everyone.